Hi, everyone. My name is Chris. Uh, this is my, myself and my co-founder, uh, Gordon Brander. Uh, he wishes he could be here today, but uh, wasn't in the cards. Um, Gordon and I are former browser engineers. Uh, Gordon was previously at Mozilla, and we had the good fortune to run into each other and work together while uh, at Google Chrome. Um, and I say we are former web browser engineers because now we're uh, scummy native app engineers <laughs> building a native app called Subconscious. Um, subconscious is a tool for thought, and if you aren't familiar with the jargon, tool for thought is like a personal notebook. Um, if you've used Notion or Rome, in, Rome Research or Obsidian or anything like that, or even Evernote, uh, or even if you just take notes uh, with Markdown and a text editor, you've used a tool for thought. Um, we have the rather lofty ambition uh, to become a massive multiplayer app over a credibly unowned globally distributed knowledge graph. Um, and a simpler way of us framing that is we want to be a browser for what we call a worldwide wiki. When I first wrote this talk um, until about two hours ago, I thought I was going to be presenting to a bunch of folks who were like, I'm interested in writing an app uh, using IPFS. And I feel like I'm actually talking to a bunch of people who know a whole lot about IPFS, probably way more than me, and uh, want to know what's so hard about writing an app with IPFS. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to do something that I didn't intend initially for this talk and that I don't ever do for talks and encourage a lot of interruption as I'm going through so that we can just maybe talk about what I'm talking about. Um, and maybe you can you know, pick my brain about what my thought process was, and I can pick your brain about how I can do things better. Uh, does that sound good? Cool. All right. Uh, so who recognizes this uh, crazy scrolling of a crazy person picture up on the slide? So this is uh, a graphic from a white paper from the 70s describing a system called Xanadu. Um, it's not actually the scrolling of a crazy person. Well, not really. Um, but what it's describing in visual terms is a series of interconnected documents um, where all the documents, uh, they're linked in two different ways. Um, one is just through what you might think of as a hyperlink, um, where one document references another. Uh, another form of linking is uh, it calls transcludes, where one document will like interleave another document. Um, so you actually have like content from one document showing up in another document. Um, and you can think of subconscious as trying to establish a similar system. So uh, subconscious users have notebooks. Notebooks are lists of notes. Notes can link to other notes and also transclude other notes. Um, and that includes notes that are in other users' notebooks. And there's no central control over naming and no central control over storage. Um, and so this is sort of our journey towards IPFS, I would say, is trying to figure out how can we put together the pieces that are going to give us these properties uh, in our application. And what this looks like, you know, sort of in visual terms with subconscious, is like here I've got somebody's notebook, um, and it's got a transclude in it, and zooming in, you can see at the bottom there's an annotation of the provenance of that transclude. And for us, this is what we think of as a link uh, through subconscious space. Um, it's you know, sort of analogous to a hyperlink, but it's for our own little data domain. Um, and the link uh, looks like this. It's sort of like an at, if you're familiar with, uh, like in Discord or uh, Slack, like I'm adding Gordon, um, and then I'm sub-addressing into his notebook using slash evolution. Um, and by doing that and putting that in my note, uh, I get a fancy little transclude from somewhere in the ether. Um, and so to get a system with these properties, we're designing a thing we're loftily calling New Sphere a protocol for thought. <laughs> and what it really is is sort of a series of IPFS adjacent constructs. So it's an IPLD data structure. Uh, it's a public key infrastructure. It's a de decentralized authorization scheme. And uh, what is what we call a hyperlocal peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer network topology. And just to sort of you know, level set, uh, when I say hyperlocal, I actually borrowed this from uh, a thing called GNUnet. Um, GNUnet. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, um, but they GNUnet is like a, a DNS-compatible name system, or at least they want to be. 
um, that proposes a hyperlocal topology where you're essentially managing your, like, your own zone file for the entire network. So it's hyperlocal because you're, you have like primary agency over the names in the name system. All right, uh, so we started uh, with Rust. So all of our you know, IPFS adjacent stuff is using Rust ecosystem crates. Um, our prototype client, um, as Dietrich suggested earlier, is an iOS app. Um, and actually it's mostly built with Swift UI. Uh, but even on the UI side, we have um, some places where we're really just wrapping Rust code uh, with Swift UI wrappers. Uh, but primarily what we're using Rust for is um, you know, all of the IPFS adjacent stuff. Uh, thankfully, Rust you know, has a nice, fairly well lit, uh, lit path uh, to linking uh, with uh, iOS. Um, but another constraint we have is we want to deploy to the web. Uh, we want to deploy to the uh, native web without any extensions. Uh, we don't want to deploy to a web view wrapped up in a native app. Um, and uh, I already know that some of you are thinking like, ha ha ha, <laughs> uh, IPFS on vanilla web, that's gonna be fun. Um, uh, so uh, in the Rust, I mean, how, how many Rust developers are in the room right now? One, two, a little bit. Yeah. So, so maybe y'all aren't too familiar with the state of the IPFS ecosystem uh, for Rust. Um, I'm happy to say it's mostly good. I'm sad to say that if you went and installed the IPFS crate in Rust, you'd be sadly disappointed to find a two-year-old crate with a bunch of out-of-date dependencies that doesn't actually work most, in most senses of the word. Um, but things like SIDS, things like IPLD, things like encoding is DAG CBOR, like all that stuff, thankfully has primitives that work really well. Um, for the most part, uh, because, as you'll see, because of how we've implemented our, our system, having these core primitives has been really valuable. Having like a full-fledged IPFS implementation would have helped us get started, but isn't really necessary for our use case. Um, for authorization, we're using UCANs, and I think everybody in this room probably is familiar with them at this point. Um, anybody, anybody not familiar with UCANs at this point? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Brick, Brick doesn't really know what UCANs are, so I'm gonna explain. Uh, you know, they're an authorization scheme. Uh, they're based on JSON web tokens. Uh, they basically let us do authorization without you know any kind of centralized authority, uh, which is really nice. Um, we wrote the Rust crate for UCANs. Um, it's currently tracking the 0.8 <laughs> version of the spec, I know 0 0.9 is in the works, and we have some distance to travel before we're compatible with that. Um, but we're trying to track it closely. Um, I'm also happy to say that Protocol Labs has uh, um, given us a dev grant uh, to pursue work on RSU can, so um, very excited about that. Thank you, Protocol Labs. Um, and if you're really uh, still lost, uh, you can find all the info on ucan.xyz. It's a great documentation resource. Uh, so getting back to this, um, how do we resolve Gordon Brander slash evolution to some concrete content in our notebook? Um, so let's start with our IPLD data structure. Um, at the root and at the leaves of our data structure, we have this construct we call a memo. So a memo is intended to be this open-ended data structure um, that encodes three things. One is body content. Body content, free form, can be whatever you want. Two, inline headers, which is essentially freeform metadata about that body content. Um, and then three is a parent pointer uh, to a previous version of the memo. And what this gives us is sort of basic backwards chronological history for, for example, notes, but also for your entire notebook history. Um, what the, this is a simplification, but what the full notebook data structure looks like is this. Um, you have at the root a uh, data type we call a sphere. And the sphere, while keeping track of your notes, also keeps track of a few other important things. One is it keeps track of a mapping of human readable names to public keys. Um, and the other thing is a mapping of human readable names to content IDs that point to your notes. Um, every sphere also has a public key associated with it, which is pretty important for our approach to addressing other notebooks. Um, and what that full sort of system looks like is this, since we have the sphere, and the sphere gives us these human readable mappings to dids and zids. Uh, 
if we only had some kind of name system where we could publish a, you know, a correlation between a did and a sid, we could then say, okay, for some human readable name in my notebook, I can get a key and I can go look in that name system and resolve that key to some sid in somebody else's notebook. And from that notebook, I can resolve some subpath like slash evolution to a concrete note. And so essentially by having this sort of symmetry across notebooks in terms of the data structure, we're able to uh, allow human readable uh, links inside of a note um, that point to other concrete content within our uh, new sphere, as we call it. Um, so getting back a little bit to one of our requirements, which is that we're able to do sort of like a vanilla browser implementation of the application. Um, obviously, we're not going to be running IPFS full nodes in our client. Um, this is what our uh, sort of network, network infrastructure looks like. I would say the main conceit of this is uh, we require that there is a user-owned server in the mix. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, there's a user-owned server in the mix. We call this the gateway server. Uh, the gateway is essentially responsible for things like syndicating uh, data to IPFS or interacting with the DHT. Um, it also is able to uh, pull extra weight since we have it in, in the mix. So like another thing our gateway server does is when you synchronize your notes to the gateway, uh, it generates an HTML hypertext web version of your notebook and makes that available on the hypertext web. Um, sort of looking at a cross section of this infrastructure. By, by the way, are there any questions so far? I'm sure you guys are thinking. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the, uh, any, anybody else? No? Okay. Um, so this is like a cross section of what that infrastructure looks like. Um, so I mentioned we're doing UCAN based authorization. Uh, the uh, r relationship between the client and the gateway server is just a REST API um, with UCAN uh, authorized REST actions. Uh, the gateway server is just uh, associated with um, the, the did uh, that points to your notebook um, and uh, any you can that is essentially delegated authority from that did is able to operate on the REST API in the gateway server. Uh, similarly, the way we enable multi-device is we create dele delegated uh, you can authorizations for other devices and then those devices are able to operate on the server. Um, the server in turn uh, talks to DHT to um, publish names and also talks to an IPFS node. And this can be any IPFS block API. We're not you know, levying any kind of prescription that the user necessarily owns that because we're really just using it for block syndication. The um, gateway server and the client are both currently caching uh, all the blocks for the notebook um, to enable things like offline local first use cases. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's, you know, this is sort of like the evolution of what our name system uh, went through. We first prototyped it using a smart contract um, on the Cosmos blockchain, um, which is really nice actually, because since all of our code is written in Rust, uh, we were able to compile a Rust smart contract down to WASM. Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, de deploy it to a, oh, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> uh, deploy it to a Cosmos chain. <clears throat> Um, but of course, as you might expect, uh, having mutable pointers constantly being updated in a blockchain is very expensive. Um, so we did not pursue that route, even though it was kind of interesting for a prototype and worked. Um, and now we're using uh, libp2p, which I'm happy to say actually has a very nice Rust implementation. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, there are going to be pitfalls, at least there are pitfalls I'm aware of as somebody who's fairly new to this space that we're going to run into relying on a DHT for this. I'm actually very curious about the pitfalls I'm not aware of. Like, I know that we're gonna have to care a lot about pure quality <laughs> and like pure availability on the network. If there are other things we're gonna run into down the road and you know about them, please uh, pipe up. I mean, I think in your model, a lot of it is just setting expectations for a lot of things and you are ultimately choosing to run some super peers. Right. Right? What Fission ended up doing is we write everything to DNS text records. Okay, yeah. Um, for the reason of not wanting to keep it in a centralized database. Mm -hmm. Right, you've, yeah. you've gone 
one step further and already doing a Canadian based system. Right. Right, which is which is not coupled to DNS at all. Yes, although we do have ambitions to have certain kinds of intercompatibility with DNS. So. Yeah, and, and I think all of us need to look at the W3 name stuff mm -hmm. that got presented and ongoing IPNS work. And, right. Um, but I think, like, I think it's totally appropriate for a vendor, an app developer, et cetera, to manage one or more namespaces right. as one of the value adds that you bring. Yes. Um, I mentioned hyperlocal name system, which you know is sort of the arrangement we're hoping to achieve. Uh, we are intending, I, I should just caveat, to offer a managed uh, service where people can sort of pay for infrastructure. Um, and one of our is, is sort of you know both a, a conceit for the sake of our you know our own ability to stay alive, but also to sort of seed the network with content. Do we intend to pre-seed every iOS client with a name that points to our address book? Um, so uh, there will be you know right. some amount of what you're talking about. Um, uh, by the way, uh, conspicuously absent from this <laughs> is IPNS. Uh, I had actually used or tried to use IPNS many years ago, um, and I knew it was slow. Uh, in preparing for work on subconscious, I had done a fair amount of research about like how are things now, um, uh, and what I found on GitHub were you know many sent to threads about the slowness of IPNS and sort of ongoing mitigations to improve it. Um, we basically never even tried to use it because I just assumed it wouldn't really work for us in terms of latency. Um, I, if things are better now, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I have to ask a question. What did you lose by going, or did you lose anything by going from the smart contract thing to just like not having it? So the main thing we lost, I mean, it, it loses a strong term. Um, we went from having like a global universal namespace to the hyperlocal approach that we're using now. Um, does, both, that make, does that make the product worse in any way? Actually, I think it is better, personally. Um, Gordon and I both have this thing about um, sort of the Dunbar scale um, social group concept. It's like, you know, social groups past a certain size start to degrade in terms of their uh, quality. Um, and it's not that we want to like, uh, uh, definitively limit the scope of like a social graph in NewSphere. We don't want to do that at all. Uh, but we do want to encourage like, uh, I guess, more wholesome organic social connections. Um, and I think a hyper-local name system is actually better suited to that than like a single global namespace. Um, so uh, I've basically given you the rundown of what we're currently building. Um, we're hoping to open source our entire stack top to bottom, including the iOS app, um, we are shooting for the second half of this year to do our first sort of open source landing of these projects. Right now it's all being done on GitHub, but it's private repos. Um, this is sort of a look at, you know, our roadmap as we proceed from there. So private data is a really big one. Um, right now we're describing a system where basically everything's public. And um, I mean, I don't need to tell this room, but it's, you know, it's a tricky problem to solve. Uh, and there are some folks in this ecosystem who are working really hard to build tools to solve it. So like PureGoss, for example, and um, Fission with web native file system. Um, and I learned a little while ago that Fission is rewriting uh, most of web native file system in Rust. Um, so I'm hoping to sort of just be able to compartmentalize <laughs> this whole problem into Brooke's brain uh, and. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man, we're, we're all RS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, which I, I admit is a little hand wavy, but I'm actually very optimistic that um, there's going to be a very flourishing, you know, uh, body of work that comes out of that. So um, we're tabling that strategically uh, until we get to a point where the path forward is more obvious for us. Um, Geis are our notion of user programmability inside of notebooks. Um, so originally these were envisioned as user scripts, essentially, 
uh, that work over your corpus of notes and sort of remix the notes and represent them, both your notes and the notes of other notebooks, to sort of give you these sort of um, moments of epiphany or like provocative prompts for producing more notes. But it's sort of, as we you know thought about it and evolved it, uh, turned into more of like a, a user scripting model based around WASM and like sort of we could syndicate these WASM blobs over IPFS and wow, what if we had like some kind of like immutable uh, computation stuff going on and then I realized, oh, IPFS community is already working on this stuff. So maybe this is another thing we can just defer a little bit and wait until uh, stuff crystallizes here um, and then we can benefit from it. Uh, but for now, we've prototyped a lot of guys, but they're all sort of like hard coded into our client. Um, support for new content types right now is text only, but you know our ambitions are to become uh, another kind of web. So images, videos, 3D models, lots of other cool stuff. Uh, Hyperlocal content moderation. So uh, you know I already described the name system, but what if we could sort of infer reputational properties of content based on what your mutuals, for example, think about content? Um, so as you're navigating through the new sphere and you're uh, running aground against notebooks you've never seen before, links can be annotated with like this person thought this was like violent content or dangerous content. Um, we really like ideas like this because it seems like the antidote to what plagues us a lot in social media these days, um, where like Twitter is unilaterally in charge of deciding what's acceptable content on their platform, uh, but their definition of acceptable may not be, you know, relevant to every single viewer. So um, COA and passkey, uh, like in the end, like we wanna make sure that we uh, sort of fit into the, the key generation or derivation mechanism for like whatever the platform is we're delivering the app on. Um, uh, one of the things we recently decided to do that I, I'm really excited about uh, getting started on is an Obsidian plugin and uh, FuseFS. Um, this wasn't a thing we were always sure we wanted to do, but more recently, it seemed like a good idea. And yeah, that's sort of where we are, uh, subconscious on IPFS. Nice. Um, this is a uh, link to Gordon's blog, which is awesome. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I uh, highly recommend. Uh, and he it's basically the only public resource we really have for subconscious at this point. Um, and there's a form there if you want to sign up for the alpha. Signing up right now. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to go back to the slide because I think that's a really useful list of stuff. This. Because again, yeah. this is kind of what we're pointing at and going like, oh, here are all shared areas that various people might say. Like, so the UK community in general has been like, yes, we want to make the ASCII work. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and other things like that. Again, you've got a slightly different layer, so you don't even have to do that that layer, but there may be, there's, you either. I think the other thing to note is that you will be the only um, native mobile app with UCAN support. That um, we know of. Um, <laughs> well, we, um, so, so part, part of that is, like, so we heard from the, the NPS store team that they want to do more stuff there as well. So mm. whether it's you or Vision or NFT that storage doing a prototype or something like that, like we have, I would like everybody who's doing stuff to list a similar roadmap piece to see if we can find overlaps to spec, interop, oh God, hopefully Chris will solve this, hopefully Moses will solve this, hopefully then we'll go make us a spec at the W3C or, or whatever, um, including other things like end to end flows, like can we, um, can we do, um, can we use the, uh, new sphere, the subconscious client, to reuse your gig to sign into an arbitrary, you can aware did app, and that might not be in scope. Like that's like a weirdo beta feature kind of thing like that. But it, if you want to get more usage out of a subconscious identity, that might be interesting for you. That there's like a roadmap versus prototype thing that yeah. obviously isn't the same thing. Yeah. What do, you, like, what do you think about? I mean, to some extent, I wonder if that's solving it at the right layer. Like maybe there's some identity or some you like some authorization capability that's given to you at a layer above, like the specific apps that is then, yeah, that's the portable part. But yeah, I mean, it's quite possible, and I think, you know, we want we've deliberately designed NewSphere to be like an open-ended, extensible thing. Um, 
like we want to see, like one of our success metrics will be like, there's an alternative application that's using it, right? Um, uh, so, you know, perhaps in, in that world or that landscape where we have multiple sort of apps on top of this data structure, um, that type of portability would be valuable. Um, yeah. did, did you evaluate any like authorization capabilities syntax was other than you can? Um, so there, we've, we're thinking about authorization in terms of maybe more Web2 traditional mechanisms. Um, the reason why we lighted on the UCANs at all is because we met with Boris and Brooke and we were trying to determine, can we use Vision? Um, unfortunately, as our prototype is a native iOS app, the answer is no. Um, but in that meeting, they described to us this capability mechanism that they're working on. And you know, me being you know the scrappy engineer that I am, I was like, well, I would love to use Vision. We can't today, but I know I'm going to build a web client, and I know that they're working to sort of solve the mobile use case. So how can I maintain as much coherence with their approach as possible? So for me, it really started with, I want to use Vision, um, but I can't. But what's the baby step in that direction? Um, to the extent that there are other options out there, like I know there's like biscuits and um, and I, you know you can is inspired by macaroons and like all sorts of other ideas. Like I mean, it's all interesting, but at the end of the day, um, for us, I guess these decisions are driven by what what's going to save us the most time. Um, and although it doesn't really sound like it would save you a ton of time to write a whole authorization library from scratch, uh, I think it's going to reap re uh, returns down the road. I posted the link to Gordon's post where he kind of walks through oh, cool. what you guys wanted out of it and how you're currently thinking about that. Nice, so, thank you. Yeah. Um, just like Michael Rogers' post about those explained to his internal team, I hope that we can, in the UK, community share more of those things. Right. Um, there. Um, um, users. You're not really looking to be, you know, you have some future aspirations to extend it, have other people play and remix in different ways. Yeah. Um, what do you want more of? What are your pains? You know, like this is a good list. Yeah, I mean, I would, there was some good hallway discussion earlier, I think, about um, private data, um, things like uh, block size limit, like all these sort of hard corners that you hit when you start looking into what is it gonna to take to build an app. Um, these seem to me like, re like really hard, they're hard constraints of the system, but they're also things that could be smoothed over. Um, it shouldn't, it sounds like at least a handful of people have reinvented the same mitigations over and over again. We shouldn't have to be doing that, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, 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 like agree on some standards. Like I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, particularly Brendan. I mean, it sounds like you've you've basically run aground against every problem we're going to run aground against. I know, I, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it sounds like Brooke is also. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to be like the fifth or sixth person. You did. I don't think you are. You okay. Just, just jump in, like this is. There's some really exciting new stuff here. I want to download your app to listen to anything. Okay. Oh, I should caveat by the way. Uh, the current alpha is single player. Um, we're working on multiplayer stuff, and that's also sort of supposed to land around the same time as our open sourcing. Yeah. Still, still yeah. Uh, but I also think that, like, yeah, you're taking out the DHT. I really there's a bunch of stuff that I want to see what we've been working on on the reserve. But we think, like, in particular, we think that. Kadamia, the implementation of the DHT that I think that's used is wrong, and it's not actually Kadamia. And we would like to see what if we did it right, yeah. and if that's actually faster. So if you're right, if you're launching a new DHT, can we chat? Yeah. Um, by the way, I'm super thrilled that IRO is a whole IPFS implementation in Rest. <laughs> also, yeah. they did not know that you existed before this, yeah. and like you're doing awesome Rust stuff, and like. Just in ways in which we are similar, we jumped in and wrote a Go you can library. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Query. And so, like, there's some story similarities that are actually quite productive, right? Like, we all found yeah. a good readable spec and, yeah. and found a way to sort of like, Yeah, I'm both discouraged and encouraged by learning how similar <laughs> the path was for you. Yeah, well, and, but hopefully that only reinforces the need for us to pull us. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, it's pressure on the ecosystem from bad developers. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which is a good thing to know about. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, uh, let's do, for starters, a round of applause. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Other questions, comments, thoughts? Or first. There's that QR code again. How would the uh, no, new sphere use okay. adapter be different in scope or like functionality than just like a more generic IPFS use adapter? Because I think that exists. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as I understand it, we would have to sort of do a translation of our data structure to, you know, so, uh, um, to make it legible to that. Um, we haven't started building it, so it's possible that a generic adapter will work. No, yeah, probably, I don't know if it's it well, I'm just sort of yeah. curious. It, it seemed like the simpler path would be to just write a thing that directly understands what we're, what our data structure is. It's got a nice, relatively simple scope yeah. that maps fairly nicely yeah. with the files. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a whole other thing around multi-layer type data where it's like, hey, maybe we write a WinFS user yeah. or something, so it's all also possibly some good overlap yeah, mm -hmm. you're planning on, yeah, yeah. So yeah. all of those things, I think, on that list, like you yeah. want to make sure to get that page. All of those are like potential collaboration spaces. You, you may have noticed we simplified along some axes, like it's not a full fi hierarchical file system. You know, it's a flat namespace of mappings of names to files, which allows us to cut corners in places um, and simplify. You know, like full recursion, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, which is a you know a thing us app, app developers you know have the privilege of doing right. Um, uh, it, you're also creating UX for your users by saying this is. Yes, it's a it, we're prescribing the use case a bit right. So um, yeah. Chris, is there anything else you want to ask of the room? Uh, is um is uh, stuff like the um, there's a bunch of advanced uh, data layouts that are prescribed for IPLD. Um, there are real implementations of them in various code ecosystems, but I'm curious why are these sort of separate bodies of code and not really like considered part of core IPLD? Um, because it seems like I can't, in practice, use ITLD with block size limit. Like, I can't, <laughs> like, if, if I knew nothing about ITLD and somebody was like, here, you can just serialize this things, you know, ITLD compatible things, I'm like, okay, here's like a list of a thousand things. And I'd run aground against hard corners, right? Um, Is that kind of giving a cover in your old next talk, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer you, but like it's this a super opinion of you, and I think having someone from the IPLD team would be because I think a lot of the answers to why ADLs are the distinction is like part of the heritage of the emergence of the technologies, sure. right, where um, a lot of that came about during the thought like construction phase and like the needs right. of building up from IPLD as a substrate into a full fledged blockchain. I think that's where you got a lot of those needs. Right. How those translate into application space this question of like, do I need this enjoy how do I use this? Mm -hmm. um, I think are open questions because uh, a part part of the people that actually emerge of it. Yeah. Um, I I personally I'm I will fully admit to being under experienced with ADLs. Sure. Like don't I, I too have looked at them and it's nice to see the I feel the spec laying out, hey, these are layers yeah. and, and you work your way up to this, but like I've never managed to get high enough on the Maslowian hierarchy to like sure. Actually, yeah, I, yeah, I guess it just seems to me like you need a hash rate map tree. Like you need it. <laughs> There's no question about it, right? Um, and not only do you need it, but like for the way mutable data works, it's a thing you should be very intimately familiar with. It should be like a basic tool in the box. Um, you should not be thinking of things in terms of like, you know, just like a traditional hash map or whatever. Because um, it doesn't have the properties you need, so I don't know. I guess that's maybe that's more of a critique than a question, um, but I think that's probably the main thing. 
I think the problem is the question we should get someone who has used Alcadia else with success. And so, like, how do you consider that as well? Yeah. Well, we're using a lot of, we're benefiting from Filecoin code uh, a lot in our uh, implementation, so. Which is Thanks. basically more Rust implementations. Yes, there's a lot of Rust stuff. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you.